Jai Baba, uh, your brother Erwin asked me to tell about the darshan. Uh, the last darshan that we had was in 1969, and uh, it was Baba's wish that we go, and it was a very, very wonderful experience. We spent several days there, and on the last day, we were asked to go up we had the privilege of going up and uh, taking the last darshan of Baba, Baba's chair. And it was so fascinating to watch how each one responded to the feeling of Baba there in his chair. And that I didn't go up, I just watched for a while. And very suddenly my eye caught a flicker of movement. And I felt this presence of Baba, and I looked up, and he walked away from the chair and walked among the people who were sitting or uh, by the chair and around the chair, and went among them and patted one on the head and, and one on the uh, shoulder, just like he used to do. And I was so stunned and so filled with his love at that moment that my eyes just blurred with tears and it seemed at that moment other people just were so so touched. I remember little Chris Rieger when I saw Baba pat his shoulder and he just burst into tears and so my eyes covered with tears and when I looked up Baba was gone and of course I had never expected to see Baba in any way like that although I have seen him in the so-called subtle body before and it was a very moving experience I didn't tell anybody about it but when I got back to the States and I talked to Ivy she said Phyllis tell me did you see Baba there at the Darshan well of course you can't tell a lie so I said yes I did but don't tell anybody <laughs> oh they'll think I'm you know and but then she must have told other people so now everybody knows that I saw Baba at the Darshan. And it, it was a beautiful thing. And I've also seen Baba a few times since then. And uh, I do say that because I think it shows that Baba's still here with us. And he just shows his love sometimes inwardly through the heart. And sometimes you can catch a glimpse of him in that very uh, beautiful physically identical to his gross body, his subtle body manifestation. For example, I saw him when I went to see John Bass in the hospital just a few days before he passed away. And we were waiting in the lobby and um, I wasn't thinking about anything special. And all of a sudden, Baba was there. And I was so overcome by the love, the feeling of his beautiful, blissful, uh, love. I've never had such an experience of Baba. If I never had any other experience of Baba, uh, even if I'd never seen him physically, that experience would would uh, show me that he is who he says he is. He is the Christ. He is the Avatar. And this feeling of his love, it lasted just a short time I saw him. And uh, I knew then that, that John, of course, would, wouldn't make it physically that Baba had really come for him and it was a very very moving moment in my life and so I just wanted to share it with everybody you asked me to tell you something about my actual meeting with Baba uh, which was mostly in Myrtle Beach of course the three different darshans we had with him there or Savas which means the company of the beloved and that really was very very appropriately named. Uh, I had the privilege of a private interview with Baba. A few of us did, but he even sent the mandalay out of the room. And he asked me, you know, with gestures, uh, do you have any questions? And uh, I, I shook my head. I had no question. And uh, But then a question came up in my inner mind, you know. I didn't express it. It was a question, well, why did I go through that, that suffering? And Baba answered it immediately. He took my 
left hand and his hand and I could feel his suffering going through me through his like an exchange of, of the bloodstream. I felt his and he felt mine and it was the answer uh, that I shared his suffering and he actually told me that um, later in another service in 1958 when um, I had a very bad hip and he had of course very serious problems with, from the accident and he would ask me every day how is my hip and one day it was really bad and I just well I had to say Baba was really bad and he looked at me for a long time it seemed like an eternity from those beautiful eyes and he said I give you a bit of my suffering and so I always think of that, you know, when you you get things happening to you. Well, Baba, you're sharing a little of Baba's suffering. That was one thing. And uh, by the way, I'm I'm Phyllis Frederick, and I spell my name F I L I S because that's the way Baba spelled it on his alphabet board. And I thought that was good luck, you know, spell it like Baba did, F I L I S phonetically, and. Baba always made us feel like part of his family. He always would say, you belong to me. I've known you for ages. You don't know how many, how many lives. And uh, so it was like a part. We were treated by Baba like, like his family. And I think of that even now, um, that Baba is not only our God and our master, but he's also part of our own family today. <laughs> begin. Begin the begin. Um, I'll tell a little story about Baba in Hollywood here. We were with Baba in 1956, and uh, of course by that time uh, we learned that you always stayed close to Baba, and you never went away until you were sort of dismissed by Baba, or he had retired. He usually retired in the evening about six o'clock, and then you never saw Baba until the next morning. And so we stayed with him. I stayed very close to him all day at the Hollywood Roosevelt Hotel. And then he retired. He went up in the elevator. We all said, you know, goodbye to Baba, and he disappeared. And then I went out with my mother, whom I hadn't seen all day. I told her beforehand, with Baba, you just don't uh, desert him for anything. So we went out and we had supper, and I came back, and there was Billy Eaton uh, saying, where were you, where were you, Baba called for you. And I was so upset, he actually had called for me after he had gone upstairs, and I wasn't there. And believe me, there's nothing that can uh, upset you, you know, that you missed, something like that. So all night long I was awake and crying and upset and having a terrible time, you know. You just hate to displease Bob or upset him in any way or feel that you did something you shouldn't have done. So early the next morning about 5.30 we were outside of Baba's room and sure enough the door opened and there Baba was looking so beautiful. and. Uh, Mayor G and the Mandalay were there. And just at that moment, um, I felt how here was, were four men in the room, but three of them were just men. And the other one was God. I just, it just flashed on me so much, this tremendous gulf, although physically they were just the same. Uh, it was a very beautiful moment. And Baba looked at me, he said, uh, and here's the one that's been keeping me awake all night with her cries. <laughs> Baba knew, of course. And so I got a beautiful embrace from Baba. And I felt somehow uh, that I had to go through that. You think, well, maybe you had done something that you could have avoided. But actually it opened a kind of a floodgate of, in me. And especially that it happened here in, uh, in Los Angeles, I felt years later when I came out here that uh, it had some connection the way Baba works with you that because I had this the only disturbance I had with Baba in that whole 56 trip 
was right here in Hollywood, kind of a release of energy or whatever. He touched my soul that, that I had some link with this part of the world, and this, so it proved later. And, you know, I found out really that it was probably Bob was working for a future purpose on my subconscious or something. Now, these things are hard to understand, but intuitively I could see now that, that that's probably the reason for it. You know, Baba wanted to release some, maybe the karma I had with a lot of people here, which I certainly have. So, I don't know what else to tell you, uh, except that being with Baba is, of course, um, you have these ups and downs. It's like you're um, you're on an ocean of emotions of all kinds. The Baba brings up all kinds, negative and positive, and even go this this terrible moment maybe where you're actually bored with Baba, which you know <laughs> you can't imagine, <laughs> and you're so upset, and Baba looks at you, you know, and his eyes twinkle at you, and uh, this happened to me at the end of this trip in '56. It was a long. We'd been with Baba three weeks, and that that constant high pitch of tension, you know. And I guess we were just kind of, I was just kind of drained, you know. At that moment, Baba called for me, all alone in his room, and he patted the couch beside him, and so I sat beside him. And he took his hand and he whacked, he patted me, but really like a whack, three times on the back. And I looked at him, and I felt like an empty barrel, you know. I felt it was just empty. And, you know, when you whack an empty barrel, it's just a hollow sound. I didn't feel anything for Baba, for anyone, you know, and I, I felt a little disturbed, you know, that I was just so nothing, you know. And then the next day, Baba uh, left. And then it was just like Baba turned the key as we stood around him in that airport. Um, all of a sudden, all that emotion, that love came back for Baba, and it seemed to hit everyone. We were all just so full of, uh, we were all crying and feeling this tremendous uh, sadness at parting from Baba. We all sort of went through that. And I was really uh, just a mess for about four or five hours after <laughs> Baba left. and. Um, all that love for him just poured back into that empty barrel. So you see how Baba works on you, you know, he goes, you go through all these things. And then afterwards, suddenly it was all turned off. We were so happy. We'd spent all this time with Baba, and there were about 40 of us going back on this plane to New York. And we had a terrible trip. Uh, lightning struck one of the wings and uh, broke one of the engines. And, Everybody else in the plane was just green with terror. And we were all laughing and singing and joking. And the stewardess said, but, but uh, what is it? <laughs> How are you feeling this way? And this? we said, oh, we've just spent three weeks with the Avatar, with the Christ. He's not going to kill us all off right now. <laughs> and sure enough, the plane did land safely. And uh, our trip with Baba was over that journey of the heart, I called it, with Baba. One of those very special things. We had a privilege to be with Baba that long. So, <laughs> uh, I'd like to add a little more about the 1956 trip. Uh, Mayra was not uh, with Baba on this trip. None of the women Mandalay were. And since we've been so close to her in 1952, I automatically thought, well, she must love to know how what's happening and so on. This thought was in my head, and of course, Baba knows your every thought, and it uh, goes like this, you know. And I said, Baba, I'm thinking of Mayra and how she would want to know what's happening here. And he went like that. I said, uh, could we write to her? Could I write to her? And Baba this time had put five of us together. He, he would hold up his hands like that for the five. This was myself, Adele, uh, Billy Eaton, uh, Beryl, and Sylvia Gaines. And he always called the five of us in, which was kind of a significant, I don't know, just maybe in reference to five, you know, these numerical things. And so we were always called in as the five. 
And Baba said we could all write a letter to Mera every day, the five of us. So, but he had to read it. Uh, we had to read it to him, rather, uh, each day. So we got this privilege every day of being called in, the five, and reading our letter to Mera. And that was really a, a very lovely thing, as we got a little extra time with Baba. And uh, he would say very... Um, sometimes very beautiful things about Mera, um, you know, like she is the one I really love and uh, things like that. So when they went back to India, then uh, he allowed Mera to write to us, which was unique. I think at that time she had uh, never been allowed to write anyone. And so uh, we got letters from her about what happened after Baba returned. And in that way, gradually, since everybody wanted to hear it too, and we used to type copies of her letters and news from India, and, and from that arose the family letters. Eventually, Mani took over and told us news from India. Uh, and so from that, we, we uh, got the family letters, which are a really priceless record of Baba and his activities. But uh, it was a very... Uh, very wonderful thing to be close to Baba, like that sort of, especially just five girls, you know. <laughs> and uh, it seemed that Baba was more relaxed with us. And incidentally, it's kind of interesting how uh, Baba likes people to be very natural with him and not, you know, in awe of him or uh, asking personal questions all the time. If you sort of weren't that way, then you kind of, Baba liked you around, especially if you were jolly and maybe it cheered him up and there were people like Anita who always managed a joke for Baba and Baba would say that it lightened his burden because he on the trip uh, very often he would go into what you'd call his universal work phase and his eyes you can see this in some of the films his eyes would turn up and close and his fingers would start working and we'd all fall silent, and we'd know that that moment Baba was really uh, uh, working in the other planes and for a few moments. Then it, suddenly he would come back, just almost it seemed like he'd come back into his body. It was such a shocking change. And then he'd be full of fun again, and immediately he'd want someone to tell a joke. And so these jokesters were very important, people like Harry Kenmore or... Um, Harry Florsheim were always there with a joke, you know, and get a smile from Baba. And I used to envy them, you know, that ability to be a sort of a clown for Baba, or Joe Harm was another one. And uh, Baba was like humor. And uh, I always used to think that before I ever heard of Baba. I used to think, I'm sure God has a sense of humor. And I didn't like the way they, uh, you know, they've always uh, shown Jesus as the man of sorrows. I'm sure he was very, uh, uh, you know, lighthearted at times. Like Baba told us in 52, God is always lighthearted, even when he's crucified. And um, he said one time that the whole universe is a joke. Sometimes a very sad joke, but it's still a joke. And you have to think of that sometimes. <laughs> You've asked me to tell about some time when I got uh, mad at Baba. Well, I, I never did. Uh, but what happened one time was in 1958, uh, I had this very, very bad hip. And with all these people crowding around Baba and all the uh, you know, energetic things we had to do, I was always very, uh, you know, upset because I was just a tiny push and the, the whole thing would have collapsed my sacroiliac or something. So I was a little tense, you know. And one time, uh, I think it was Baba who sent me forced out of the uh, lagoon cabin to get something. And I didn't want to miss a moment of his presence, you see. Well, it happened to be raining that day. And uh, the paths at the center are, are, of course, dirt paths and full of roots and things. And here I was slipping and sliding and I was so afraid, really, that I was going to fall and uh, hurt my hip again, and I got real mad at all the rain. I think, gee, why did it have to be, you know, just this moment? And 
all of a sudden in the woods there, it was like, I can't describe it, but I felt Baba in everything, in every leaf and every drop of rain and the, the muddy path and the roots in my way. And it's like I heard, I didn't hear his voice, but I, it was like I heard him say inside my heart, are you, put, you know, are you angry with my universe, with me, my world, my creation? You know, I'm putting into words the wordless thought. Like, how can you be annoyed with this beautiful creation of mine? And so I just forgot instantly, you know, my bad temper, and I, I, uh, you know, I went back to the cabin and, you know, there was Bob and he smiled at me, you know, as if he knew every little feeling I'd gone through, you know. And I, I that feeling comes back to me because we all go through these very, you know, down moments in life and you just think, oh, to hell with everything, you know. And then that moment comes back of, how can you be mad at my creation? Mm -hmm. At me, here I am in everything, you know. Wanted to hear a little story about uh, Elizabeth's dog. You wanted me to tell a little story about Elizabeth's dog, Foundy, which she named Foundy because she found him in India. She came back with him from America in 1948, <clears throat> and, um, 47, 48, and he was very old then, and of course he started to sicken and die, and she's crying over it, and Baba came by and said on his alphabet board, he will live longer than Gandhi. And uh, Gandhi was shot the next day, and Foundy died the day after. Uh, so that's a little story about Foundy. And, and the other story was uh, that you wanted me to tell was about, in 1952 when I first met Baba, uh, I had wondered how he would look to me, and I thought, when I first saw him, I might be reminded of Jesus or of what. But actually, when I, the first glimpse I got of Baba, he, he looked to me Egyptian. The thought flashed through my head that he looked Egyptian. He had these long, beautiful eyebrows and a pair of a golden olive skin and dark eyes. And, and that very same evening, we were sitting with Baba with the women, Mandalay, and he looked at me and he went like this and he said, that, uh, Phyllis looks to me Egyptian and Persian. And obviously he was recalling uh, some past lives of mine. And in the following year after I met Baba, all sorts of memories awoke of my life with Baba in Egypt. And um, another interesting little bit about Baba being Egyptian himself uh, Ruana Bogoslav told me when she first met Baba, uh, she and her daughter met Baba, and Baba was very kind to them and looked after their comfort, and she said to him, Baba, why are you so good to me and my daughter? And he said, because you were very good to me once long ago in Egypt. So Baba must have had an Egyptian incarnation. And... Uh, of course, he, he very seldom told you about the past or the future. It's like he wanted you to concentrate directly on the now, on him and the now. Of course, we know Baba was, was the avatar in many past avataric manifestations. And you felt like you were with Christ or you were with the Buddha at certain moments, like in 1952, Baba went with us to Brook Green Gardens, and we walked with him under the trees, and then he sat down under a tree, and he said, this reminds me of the time when I was Buddha. As you know the story of Buddha, he sat under the bow tree and received uh, the God-realized state. And Baba said to us um, that the, the God-realized um, master who took off that veil of sanskaras, yoga yoga sanskaras, from him when he was the Buddha was an old woman. So it's sort of like uh, uh, Babajan, which uh, I've studied the life of Buddha and there's no mention of an old woman 
except that one woman who fed him just before he was realized. So maybe that's the remnant in history of that um, bit of information that Baba gave us there in Myrtle Beach in 1952. And um, he would always say he was the ancient one. And, uh, for example, when Mildred Kyle met him, she was 95 years old. And she said, I'm so old, Baba. And she had this tremendous halo of white hair. <laughs> she waited so long to meet Baba. The Baba said, but I am the ancient one, the oldest of the old. <laughs> It was so sweet, you know. So she didn't feel old anymore. <laughs> Ancient. Baba always had some very beautiful, tactful thing to say to everyone. It was just the essence of that, that tact and, and tenderness toward everybody. And meeting, seeing him meet so many people of so many different ages and kinds and feel, you know, a variety of feelings toward him. It was just amazing how in a few seconds this sense of communion, of contact with the soul uh, was established by Baba in his silence so that everybody felt, felt his reality, no matter what their opinion of him was. Like, my father was a big skeptic, you know, and he always laughed at me and my interest in Baba. But he came to see Baba just out of curiosity, probably. Um, and he was just overcome. He came out and he said, Oh, Baba's a very, very wonderful man, a very honest, good soul, you know. I think his fear was that, you know, he's going to be a jip, <laughs> uh, you know, like so many of these skeptics. But he even touched my father's heart. And of course, that made me feel very, uh, very good. And he even came to see Baba again. Uh, the second trip Baba made. So, you see how Baba could touch everybody. And there was one doctor uh, who had quite a few Baba patients, and she was very skeptical too. She thought we were an emotional bunch of, you know, stupid people. And, and um, but curiosity drew her to see Baba. And I remember her standing there in the waiting room. All around were all the people who'd met Baba, who were waiting to see Baba. A lot of them were crying and, you know, going through a lot. And she looked very scornfully around at every, you know, a bunch of emotional idiots, you know. So then um, I was busy and I came back about ten minutes later, and there she was, standing in the middle of the room, crying, sobbing, uncontrollably. She'd met Baba, and Baba touched her heart. And she said, oh, now I know what you people mean by love, by Baba's love. You know, Baba just broke down all that intellectual, you know, skepticism and really gave her a poke in the heart. And so she wasn't, uh, <laughs> it was so funny, after she'd been, uh, you know, looking down on us, and there she was, just as emotional and in touch as everybody else. It reminds me of another story that Narina told about this very high up professor of philosophy in Rome that somehow was a friend of hers or she got him to see Baba. He walks in and he doesn't give Baba a chance. He starts right away telling his theories about what God is and what this is and what that is. And he went on for about 10 minutes, you know, giving a big discourse. Baba didn't say a word. And suddenly he took his alphabet board and he flung it in the corner of the room and this man just, he was just, he was suddenly overwhelmed with Baba's love and he started to weep, he didn't say another word, and he just bowed at Baba's feet and he said, now I know, I know what love is. And he, you know, stumbled out. And that was the end of his intellectual, <laughs> his big thing with his intellect. And uh, of course, he wished Baba would do that to a lot of these, you know, skeptic brains around of our time. But uh, well, it was his grace, you know, to do that. Maybe he'll do that to some more of us in his manifestation. So, what was it that? actions that convinced you that Baba was God? Well, again, 
It was the inner experience of Baba. Before I met him, I had, I've, I've, you know, I've talked a little bit about it before somewhere else, <laughs> but uh, Baba really appeared to me in the, uh, in the subtle body, whatever you want to call it, and uh, I sort of embraced him in this inner meeting and got this tremendous shock of his divinity for just a second or no, a fraction of time that's timeless, you know, and that it just completely uh, wiped me out. I've never doubted Baba. Your mind goes through all kinds of, you know, crazy things, but your heart never doubts, and that's what Baba said the first day we met him. He said, love, love is all I want. He said, mind tends to doubt, but love never doubts. The heart never doubts. So love, love me. And when you love me, God is pleased. And God's loving means everything. But when you love me, God loves you, and God's loving means everything. That was one of the first things Baba said to me when I met him. That May 10th, 1952. So. That's why you have India? Because of the preparation that you've seen Baba? So oh, well, I waited a long time before I met Baba in 1952 in Myrtle Beach. Mm. Yeah. It didn't make you want to go to India? Oh, we tried, but it was during the war. Oh. And nobody could travel. And so I think Baba in his mercy, because we were separated from him at that time, kind of gave us inner uh, experiences or, you know, courage to go on and wait for him all those years. And of course we got letters and cables and so on, full of Baba's love. Did Baba say anything about the war at that time? Uh, not very much. That was the Second World War? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I understand he said things to the man who there in India, but uh, uh, nothing about, you know, uh, except that he had predicted the war, of course, long ago in the 20s. And, uh, you know, the greater Holocaust would come with more uh, destructive weapons and stuff, which, of course, turned out to be the atom bomb. But he did say that he would speak, and after he spoke, there would be world peace, you know, of course, Baba. And at that time, we were waiting every every month, every hour for Baba to break his silence, you know. In those first years, it was like, you could just about exist for the next few months, and then you thought Baba would break his silence or come to America, you know. But it just didn't happen for a long time. That he finally came in 1952. And actually, I, after meeting Bob and being with him in his silence, which was the silence that speaks through the heart, uh, you know, all that excitement about Bob breaking his silence sort of faded away from me anyway. You know, it sort of didn't matter anymore. You know, because in, in the silence, Baba speaks. He speaks the language of the heart, the love. And that we have, we can have now, Bob is speaking. Eternally, you know. So, but of course, uh, you have to be able to listen <laughs> to that language of the heart. And lots of times, you know, like I have a sore ear now, um, your, your spiritual ears get clogged up and you don't hear bother. And you get maybe disturbed, just depressed, and blah, blah, blah. And then, then it comes back, you hear them again. Do you recall any time that Baba said he would break a silence on a specific day? Oh yes, there are lots of messages in different times when Baba said he would definitely by the end of this time or that time break a silence. And there's a great deal of reference material on that. Did, uh, did you ever feel, uh, did you feel that if he didn't break a silence that you would doubt him? No. Whatever God wants to do. I always felt that, you know, in reading the Bible, and again, reading the Bible after Baba, uh, and knowing Baba, you see that all humanity is, uh, you know, they're trying to figure out what God wants, but you'll never really figure it out, what he's really doing. And 
You just have to have that faith and trust. And God is just not going to tell you everything about everything. And uh, so what he wants to do, you just have to accept it. You know, Baba wants to do this or do that or <coughs> not do this or not do that or change his plans. I mean, after all, what's his privilege? If he made the whole creation, he can certainly monkey around with it a little bit. <laughs> so who are you to say? You know, why should he tell you about everything? You know, <laughs> that's kind of presumptuous. So I don't know. Of course, you want to know. Everybody wants to know the future. But Baba very, very seldom told you personally anything that would happen. And actually, when you're with Baba, like I said before, the moment is so eternal, so great, that you don't give a hoot about the future. I never asked Baba about the future. And the past, you know, Baba says it's a frozen lake. What are you going to do about it? You know, chunk of ice, forget it. <laughs> I'm sorry, that sounds... <laughs> but anyway, it just didn't seem to matter with Baba. Nothing mattered. It was all like, all of a sudden you stepped out of the illusion a little bit into a magic circle around Baba. And you just didn't give a darn about the whole thing. We never paid any attention to what was going on out there in the world. Yeah. At that moment, who cared about anything but Baba? Now, or when that's really enough. <laughs> Jai Baba. When Baba went, when Baba dropped his body, what uh, was your thoughts at that time? Well, uh, I didn't feel sad. The only sadness I felt was that all these young people here who had, you know, we were all in the middle of planning to go to India uh, would never see him. And that, that was the only thing that upset me. It doesn't upset me that Baba drops the physical body. It gave him enough suffering, you know. So. And he's not that body. He's not even the subtle body that you see. He's not the mental body. He's, you know. Uh, so that's just the end of his mission. So, of course, it had to come. But uh, I did feel upset. These young people and their love for Baba would not see him. But thinking it over now, I see that was their karma, their destiny. And in one way, it unfolded the heart more. And uh, Baba did tell us that. He said, uh, when he's in the body, he's for the few. And that most of humanity would come to him after he dropped the body. Don't you think maybe like some of the um, young people today were um, actually with Baba, like maybe in the last life? Do you think that's possible? Um, oh, yes, that's true. I think so. You're all young enough so that you might have met Baba. You might have been some old bearded villager in a <laughs> And then you, you were drawn back. You certainly would have been drawn back to him from some contact with him in the past. And Baba said that once to us. He said, like, at the end of 52, uh, we tried so hard to have everybody meet Baba, and of course there were some who never made it. And I was thinking in my heart, oh, this one, that one didn't come. Baba read my thought, he turned around, he said, everyone came that I want to come. Mm -hmm. So it's all his will. There's nothing you can do about it, it's his will. And so he knows the right moment for everyone, the reason, you know, why and the why not. And you just have to accept that, which was hard. It was hard when we had someone we really uh, thought and had tried so hard to come to Baba and wanted to meet him, and then they didn't come at the last moment for, you know, a dozen reasons, and we felt very upset, and Baba said, no, everyone came that he wanted to come. So you just relax. You think it's all God's will, whatever. The whole thing is, that's what it is. Oh, I always had this question. Um, about Bob was saying something about the souls that were born like from the late forties on. Something about them being a mass incarnation of old souls. Is this true? Did Bob say anything about that? Oh, he forget what it was. Oh, he said he said two things. He said uh, just uh, in the the middle sixties there around the drug crisis. He said uh, uh, all these young people coming to him at that time like big wave. He said, this is my generation. And it's true, they were his generation. 
all his young people coming to him. And um, another thing he said during the war, he said that all those souls who had given their life uh, for their country, you know, whatever, uh, he said through his grace would reincarnate very rapidly. So therefore, there must be some of you who died in that war. And perhaps that's the reason the young people today are so anti-war. What the heck? They just gave up their body <laughs> 20 years ago on a battlefield. They're not too keen to do it all over again, you know. And they've been touched by Baba's grace beside. So maybe that's the uh, that's some of the reason for it all. Only now you have to uh, you have to carry the ball. Now you're Baba's generation. And that's a lot of responsibility. Erwin, come on now. <laughs> You're giving me a suntan. <laughs> what happened when you were with Baba in uh, 1952? <laughs> oh, I've already written that up in the, the New Awakener, so... Is there something you left out? You felt you'd like to... The left out. Well, what you have to leave out in any words is that uh, that experience of Baba's love, you know, it's just indescribable. What can you say about it? I only feel very upset sometimes that one can't communicate that. And it's just Baba's ineffable love that, I, you, how do you share it? It's almost impossible to share that. That feeling of love. It's just like you keep trying, you know, and uh, that's that's all we can do till he comes again. Kind of keep trying, and I, I only f I'm afraid that in our intellectualizing the way human beings do, or creating dogmas and schools and rituals and all that junk, that we forget that love. And so that's what I keep trying to remember more than anything. You asked me to say what was the most uh, rememberable, memorable point in my contact with Baba, the high point. Uh, and that's very hard to say. You know, often you'd say the first moment that you met Baba, that was really, really the high point. But then that inner meeting I had with Baba before I met him physically was a tremendous moment too. Uh, different and yet the same. Uh, also that time I saw Baba in the hospital there when John was passing away, that was again uh, another meeting with Baba on another level that just was completely uh, unbelievable. I think also sometimes just little uh, flashes of seeing Baba as God and man at once.